so anew, beauteous and lovely youth. When that shall be by birth, this is your truth. <coughs> Old John of Gaunt, time-honored Lancaster, hast thou, according to thy oath and band, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son here, to make good the boisterous late appeal, which then our leisure would not let us hear against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray. I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the Duke on ancient malice or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him in the argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence, face to face, and frowning brow to brow, Ourselves will hear the accuser, and the accused freely speak. Many years of happy days before my gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. Each day still better, others' happiness, until the heavens envying earth's good hap add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both. Yet one but flatters us as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely, to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, heaven be the record to my speech, in the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee, and mark my greeting well, for what I speak, my body shall make good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat and wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, what my tongue speaks my right drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. It's not the trial of a woman's war. The bitter clamor of two eager tongues can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot. It must be cooled for this. <laughs> Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed and not at all to say? First, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until they had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat. Setting aside his high blood's royalty, and let him be no kinsman to my liege, I do defy him. And I spit at him, call him a slanderous coward and a villain. Meantime, let us defend my loyalty, by all my hopes most falsely doth he lie. Pale, trembling coward! There I throw my gage, disclaiming here the kindred of the king, and set aside my high blood's royalty, which fear, not reverence, makes thee to accept. If guilty dread hath left thee so much strength as to take up mine honor's pawn, then stoop. By that, and all the rights of knighthood else, will I make good against thee, arm to arm, what I have spoke, or thou canst worse devise. I take it up, and by that sword I swear it gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree of chivalrous design or knightly trial. And when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great, that can inherit us so much as of a thought of ill in him. Look what I speak, my life shall prove it true. The Mowbray hath received eight thousand nobles in name of lendings for your highness soldiers, <laughs> which he hath detained for lewd employments, like a false traitor and injurious villain. Besides, I say, and will in battle prove that all the treasons for these 18 years complotted and contrived in this land fetch from false Mowbray their first head in spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain upon his bad life to make all this good that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death to me for justice and rough chastisement. And by the glorious worth of my descent, this arm shall do it or this life be spent. <laughs> oh, how high a pitch his resolution soars. <laughs> Thomas of Norfolk, what sayst thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf till I have told the slander of his blood. 
how God and good men hate so foul a lie. Noble, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son, now by my scepter's awe I make a vow. Such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray. So art thou. Free speech, and fearless I to thee allow. Then, Bullingbrook, as low as to thy heart through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Calais, dispersed I duly to his highness soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt, upon remainder of a dear account since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now swallow down that lie. For Gloucester's death I slew him not but to my own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. Mm. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honorable father to my foe, once did I lay in ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacraments, I did confess it and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest of Peel, it issues from the rancor of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot to prove myself a loyal gentleman even in the <coughs> best blood chambered in his bosom. In haste whereof, most heartily I pray your highness to assign our trial day. No! Oh. Oh. Wrath kindled, gentlemen! Be ruled by me! <sighs> Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This we prescribe, though no physician. Deep malice makes too deep incision. Forget, forgive, conclude, and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. <laughs> Good uncle, let this end where it begun. I'll call the Duke of Norfolk, you, your son. To be a make peace shall become my age. Throw down my son, the Duke of Norfolk did. And Norfolk, throw down his. Win, Harry, win. Obedience bids, thou should not bid again, should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid, there is no boot. Myself, I throw dread sovereign at thy foot. <coughs> my life, thou shalt command, but not my shame. The one my duty owes, but my fair name, despite of death that lives upon my grave, the dark dishonest use thou shalt not have. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced the soul with slander's venom spear, the which no balm can cure but his heart blood, which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame! Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge. My dear, dear Lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away, men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a ten times barred up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast. Mine honor is my life. Both grow in one, take honor from me, and my life is done. Then, dear my liege, mine honor let me try, and that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw up your gauge. Do you begin? Oh, God defend my soul from such deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen to my father's sight? Or with pale beggar fear impeach my height? Before this out dared dastard, ere my tongue shall wound my honor with such feeble wrong or sound so base a parl, my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear and spit it bleeding in his high disgrace. Where shame doth harbor, even in Mowbray's face! We were not born to sue, but to command, which since we cannot do, to make you friends be ready, as your lives shall answer it. At Coventry, upon St. Lambert's Day, there shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms be ready to direct these home alarms. 
finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur? Hath love in thy old blood no living fire? Alas, the part I had in Gloucester's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who when they see the hours ripe on earth will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. But Thomas, my oh. dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edred's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked and all the precious liquor spilt, is hacked down and his summer leaves all faded by envy's hand and murder's bloody axe. Oh, gaunt, his blood was thine, yet art thou slain in him. Thou dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, and that thou seest thy wretched brother die, who was the model of thy father's life. Call it not patience, Gaunt, it is despair. In suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life, teaching stern murder how to butcher thee. That which in mean men we entitle patience is pale, cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to avenge my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel. For God's substitute, his deputy, anointed in his sight, hath caused his death, the which, if wrongful, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defense. Why, then, I will. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry, there to behold our cousin Hereford and fell Mowbray fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's spear, that it may enter butcher Mowbray's breast. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thy sometime brother's wife with her companion grief must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry as much good stay with thee as go with me. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither come engaged by my oath, which God defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my King, and my succeeding issue against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my King, and me, and as I truly fight, defend me heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby am I, who ready here do stand in arms to prove by God's grace and my body's valor enlists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor foul and dangerous to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the lists except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knees before his majesty. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which, if today thou shed, Lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. <laughs> oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me if I be gored with Mowbray's spear. As confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. O oh, thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, doth with a twofold vigor lift me up to reach at victory above my head. Add proof unto mine armor with thy prayers and with thy blessing steal my lance's point, that it may enter Mowbray's waxen coat, and furbish new the name of John of Gaunt, even in the lusty behavior of his son. God, in thy good cause make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows, doubly redoubled, fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood. Be valiant and live 
mine innocence, and St. George to thrive. However God or fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace his golden, uncontrolled enfranchisement. More than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary. Most mighty liege and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years, as gentle and as jocund as to jest go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet breast. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valor couched in your eye. Order the trial, Marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy lance, and God defend the right. Strong as a tower in hope, I cry, amen. Go bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Sound drums. And set forward, combatants. Stay! The king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us while we return these dukes what we decree. Draw near and list what with our counsel we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds plowed up with neighbor's swords and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories, you, cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. That sun that warms you here shall shine on me. And those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Norfolk, for thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee, upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege. And I will look from, from your highness' mouth. A dearer merit not so deep a maim as to be cast forth in the common air. Have I deserved it at your highness' hands? In my native English, I have learned these thirty years my native English now I must forgo. And now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed vial or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up, or being open put into his hands who knows no touch to tune the harmony. Within my mouth you've unjailed my tongue, doubly portcullis my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance has made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then? But speechless death which robs my tongue from breathing native breath. It boots thee not to be compassionate. After our sentence, plaining comes too late. And thus, I turned me from my country's light to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Return again and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God our part therein we banish with yourselves to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall so help you truth and God embrace each other's love and banishment, nor never look upon each other's face, nor never write, regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your home-bred hate, nor never by advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear and I to keep all this. Norfolk! So far as to mine enemy, by this time had the king permitted us, one of our souls had wandered in the air, banished this frail sepulcher of our flesh, as now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly the realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along the clogging burden of a guilty soul. No, Bullingbrook, 
If ever I were a traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven, banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know, and all too soon I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray, save back to England, all the world's my way. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word? Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word? Such is the breath of kings. I think, my liege, that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile, but little vantage shall I reap thereby, for ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about my oil-dried lamp and time be wasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper shall be burnt and done blindfold death not let me see myself my uncle you have many years to live not a minute king that thou canst give shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow pluck nights from me but not lend a morrow thou canst help time to furrow me with age but stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage thy word is current with him for my death but dead thy kingdom cannot buy my breath thy son is banished upon good advice where to Thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why, at our justice, seems thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove in digestion sour. <laughs> you urged me as a judge. But I'd rather you had bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child, to smooth his fault, I should have been more mild. But a partial slander sought I to avoid. But in the sentence, my own life destroyed. Alas, I looked when some of you might say I was too strict to make mine own away. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell. And uncle, bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. Cousin, farewell. What well, presents must not know from where you do remain, let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. To what purpose dost thou hoard thy words that thou returns no greeting to thy friends? Do I have too few to take my leave of you? When the tongue's office should be prodigal to breathe the abundant dolor of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Joy absent, grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. To men in joy, but grief makes one hour ten. Call it of travel that thou takes for pleasure. My heart shall sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. A sullen passage of thy weary steps, a steam as foil wherein thou art to set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather every tedious stride I make shall but remember me what a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign passages, and in the end, having my freedom, Boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief. All places that the eye of heaven visits is to the wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit when it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor, not the king exile thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look what thy soul holds dear. Imagine it to be that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds, musicians, uh, the grass whereon thou treads, the presence strewed, the flowers, fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and sets it light. Oh no! The apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Fell sorrow's tooth doth never rankle more than when he bite, but lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son. 
I'll bring you on your way. And I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. That England's crown farewell, sweet soil adieu. My mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can, though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. Who <laughs> oh, we did observe, oh, cousin Armoral. How far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say, what store of parting tears were shed? Faith, none for me. They except the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our faces, awaked the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with the tear. And what said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. And my heart disdained that my tongue should so profane the word that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression with such grief that words seem buried in my sorrow's grave. We're merry that the word farewell of lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment. We should have had a volume of farewells, but since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. <laughs> Yet, tis doubt. When time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen will come to see his friends, ourselves, and Bushy, bag and here in green, observed his courtship of the common people. How he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy, and at the tribute of his supple knee with, thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends, <laughs> as were our England in reversion his, and he our subject next degree in hope. Well, he is gone. And with him go these thoughts now, for the rebels which stand out in Ireland. Expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness loss. We shall ourselves in person to this war, and for our coffers with too great a court and liberal largess are grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that falls short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, whereto, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants, for we will make for Ireland presently. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Well, I see. At Eli House. Now, put it, God, in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we may make haste and come too late. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Will the king come, <coughs> that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth? Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, oh. for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. <laughs> when words are scarce, they're seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to gloat. <coughs> Setting sun, music at the close, as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, written remembrance of things long past. Though Richard, my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet Undeaf is here. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds as praises of his state. Then there are found lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. So it be new, there's no respect how vile that is not quickly buzzed into his ears. Then all too late comes counsel to be heard where will doth mutiny with wit's regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose. Tis breath thou lackst and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet, new inspired, <laughs> and thus expiring do foretell of him. He's rash, 
fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. <laughs> this royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this blessed blood, this earth, this realm, this England, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear in her reputation through the world, is now leased out, <coughs> I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in by the triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, now bound in with shame, with inky blot and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was once to conquer others has made a shameful conquest of itself. Oh, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. <coughs> the king is come. Deal oh. mildly with his youth, for young hot cults being raged do rage the more. How fares our noble uncle Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is it with aged gaunt? How well that name befits my composition. <laughs> old gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched, watching breeds leanness, leanness is all gaunt. <laughs> the pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's looks, huh? and therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave whose hollow womb inherits not but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No. Misery makes sport to mark itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mark my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no. Men living flatter those that die. Thou, now a dying, sayest thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health. I breathe and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill. Ill in myself to see and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is nowhere lesser than thy lands wherein thou liest in reputation sick. Thou, too careless patient as thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown whose compass is no bigger than thy head. And yet in Cajun, in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy lands. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons. From forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, who art possessed now but to depose thyself. Why, cousin, Wert thou regent of the world, it were a waste to, to let this land by lease. But for thy world, enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law. And thou- A lunatic, lean-witted <laughs> fool. <coughs> Presuming on an ague's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition, make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now, by my seat's right, royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son? This tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, has how tapped out and drunkenly caroused. My brother Gloucester, plain, well-meaning soul, who fair befell in heaven amongst happy souls, may be precedent and witness good that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood. 
join with the present sickness that I have, and thy unkindness be like crooked aid to stop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, <coughs> but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be. <coughs> Convey me to my bed, then to my grave. <coughs> love they to live, that love and honor have. And let them die, that age and sullens have. For both hast thou, and both become the grave. I uh, do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. God. He loves you on my life and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right. You say true. As Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine. And all be as it is. My liege. Old God commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all old Lancaster hath spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt, so though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. Oh, so much for that. Now for our Irish wars. We must supplant these rough rug-headed kern which live like venom where no venom else but they have privilege to live and for these great affairs do ask some charge towards our assistance we do seize to us the plate coin revenues and movables whereto our uncle gaunt did stand possessed how long shall i be patient oh how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong not gloucester's death nor hereford's banishment nor gaunt's rebukes nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor mine own disgrace has ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. His face thou hast, for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours, but when he frowned it was against the French and not against his friends. His noble hands did win what they did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hands had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. How, oh, Richard, York is too far gone with grief, else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me if you please. If not, I please not to be pardoned and content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford? Is not Gaunt dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take away from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself. For how art thou a king, but by fair sequence and succession? Now afore God, God forbid I say true. If you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head. You lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honor and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his land. I'll not be by the while, my liege. Farewell. What may ensue hereof, there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. Go, thou, Bushy. To the Earl of Wiltshire straight, and bid him repair to us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next, we will for Ireland, and tis time, I trow. And we create, in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he is just and always loved us well. Come on, our Queen. Tomorrow must we part. Be merry, for our time of stay is short.
Well, lords. The Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living, too. For now his son is Duke. Barely in title, not in revenues. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break in silence, ere it be disburdened by a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tends that thou wouldst speak to the Duke of Hereford. If it be so, out with it, boldly, man, quick is mine ear to hear of good swords here. No good at all that I can do him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, before God, tis shame these wrongs are born in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself but basely led by flatters. And what they will inform, merely in hate, against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes <laughs> and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised as blanks, benevolences, and I what's not what. But what in God's name doth become of this? <laughs> Wars have not wasted it, for ward he hath not, but basely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. <laughs> More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king grown bankrupt like a broken man. Uh, reproach hmm. and disillusion hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars. Mm -mm. His burden is taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet seek no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the winds that soar upon our sails, yet we strike not, but securely perish. We see the very rack that we must suffer. And unavoided is the danger now for suffering so the causes of our wrath. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy life peering. But I dare not say how near the oh. tidings of our comfort is. Nay, I, let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. Oh. We three are but thyself, <laughs> and speaking so thy words are but his thoughts. Therefore be bold. Then thus. I have from Port LeBlanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, with eight tall ships, 3,000 men of war, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, <clears throat> redeem from broking pawn the blemished crown, Wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt and make high majesty look like itself. Away with me in post to Ravenspur. But if you faint as fearing to do so, stay and be secret and myself will go. To horse, to horse, urge doubts to them that fear. Hold on my horse and I will first be there. <laughs> Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. Uh -oh. To please the king, I did. To please myself, I cannot do it. Yet, I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, say bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks some unborn sorrow ripe in fortune's womb is coming towards me, and my inward soul with nothing trembles at something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. <clears throat> Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eyes, glazed with blinding tears, 
divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives, which, rightly gazed upon, show nothing but confusion. I'd awry distinguish form. <laughs> so, your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, find shapes of grief more than himself to wail, which looked on as it is, is not but shadows of what it is not. Then, thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure weep not, more is not seen, <laughs> or if it be, tis with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. However it may be, I cannot but be sad, so heavy sad, as thought on thinking on no thought, I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious Tis lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so. For nothing hath begot my something grief, or something hath the nothing that I grieve. Tis in reversion that I do possess, but what it is that is not yet known what I, I cannot name. Tis nameless woe I wot. God save your majesty. Oh. And well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shook for Ireland. Why hopes thou so? It is better hope he is, for his designs crave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power and driven into despair an enemy's hope who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravenspur. Now God in heaven forbid. Tis too true, madam. And that is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his son young Harry Percy, the lords of Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, and all their powerful friends are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broken his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all his household servants with him are fled to Bolingbroke. So green. Thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, gasping new-delivered mother, of woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joined. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair, and be at enmity with cozening hope. He is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back of death who gently would dissolve the bands of life which false hope lingers in extremity. Here comes the Duke of York. Oh. With signs of war about his aged neck. Oh, full of careful business are his looks. Uncle, for God's sake, speak comfortable words. Comforts in heaven and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I left to underprop his land, who weak with age cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was? Why so? Go all which way it will. The nobles, they are fled. The commons, they are cold. And will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. God, for his mercy, what a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. What? Are there posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say pray, pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armor that is there. Gentlemen, will you muster men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs thus disorderly thrust into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen. The one is my sovereign, whom both my duty and oath bids defend. The other, again, is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men and meet me presently at Berkeley Castle. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. The wind sits fair for news to go for Ireland, but none returns. 
For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those who love not the king. And that is the wavering comments, for their love lies in their purses. And whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lies in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Oh, thither will I with you. For a little office will the hateful commons perform for us, except like curs to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No. I will to Ireland, to his majesty. Farewell. If hearts presages be not vain, we three here part that ne'er shall meet again. That says York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once, for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. How far is it, my lord, to Berkeley now? Believe me, noble lord, I'm a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough, uneven ways draws down our miles and makes them weary. And yet, your fair discourse hath been as sugar, <laughs> making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me, what a weary way from Ravenspur to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby, wanting your <laughs> company, which I protest hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But there's a sweetened with the hope to have. The present benefit which I possess, and hope to joy is little less in joy than hope enjoyed. By this, the weary lords shall make their way seem short, as mine hath done, by sight of what I have, your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes oh. here? <laughs> it is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Wooster, whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I had thought, my lord, to have learned his health of you. Why, is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, has gone to Ravenspur to offer service to the Duke of Hereford, and sent me over by Berkeley to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there, then with directions to repair to Ravenspur. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that is not forgot which ne'er I did remember. To my knowledge, I never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. My gracious lord, <clears throat> I tender you my service, such as it is being tender, raw, and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more proved service and desert. I thank thee, gentle Percy. And be sure, I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hand thus seals it. <laughs> How far is it to Berkeley? And what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands a castle by on top of trees, manned with three hundred men, as I have heard. And in it are the lords of York, Berkeley, and Seymour, and else of name or noble estimate. Ah, here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords. I watch your love pursues a banished traitor. <laughs> All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which, more enriched, Shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence <laughs> makes us rich, most noble lord. And far surmounts our labor to attain it. Evermore thanks the exchequer of the poor, which, till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But who comes here? Ah, I shall not need transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person, my noble uncle. Show me thy humble heart and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle! Tut, tut, grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. Ugh. I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? Comes thou because the anointed king is hence. <laughs> Why, foolish boy! The king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I but now the lord of such hot youth, as when brave gaunt thy father and myself rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men from forth the ranks of many thousand French. Oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine now, prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee, 
and minister correction to thy fault. My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it, and where is? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, <laughs> thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished, Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. And noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for methinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh then, my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned? A wandering vagabond, my rights and royalties, plucked from my arms, perforce, and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king in England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, Armoral, my noble cousin. If you first died, and he been thus trod down, he should have found his uncle gone to father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, and yet my letter's patents give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all amiss employed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore, personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. It stands your grace upon to do him right. Base men by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feeling of my cousin's wrongs and labored all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver, cut out his way to find out right with wrong it may not be. And you, that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own. And for the right of that, we have all strongly sworn to give him aid. And let him ne'er see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well. I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well, unless you please to enter in the castle and there repose you for this night. An offer, uncle, that we will accept, but we must win your grace to go with us to Bristow Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Baggett, and their accomplices, the caterpillars of the commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. <laughs> it may be that I'll go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws, nor friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. My Lord of Salisbury, we have stayed here ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fright the fixed stars in heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody upon the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and leap. The one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, as well as sure that Richard, their king, is dead. Oh, Richard! With the eyes of a heavy mind, I see thy glory, like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Bring forth these men! Bushy and green, I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies, with too much urging your pernicious lives, for twere no charity. Yet, to wash your blood from off my hands here in the view of men, 
I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and lineaments, myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment. This and much more, much more than twice, all this condemns you to the death. See them delivered over to execution and the hand of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lord, farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My Lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. Buckloughly Castle coming, this at hand! Yea, my lord! <laughs> How brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Needs must I like it well. <laughs> I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand, though rebels wound thee with their horses' hoofs. As a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting so, Weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favors with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to the treacherous feet which with usurping steps do trample thee, throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. <laughs> Mock not my senseless conjuration, lords. This earth shall have a feeling. These stones prove armed soldiers, ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. Fear not, my lord. The power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss. Whilst bowling broke through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. This comfortable cousin, knowst thou that not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king? The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then, if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. Ah, welcome, my Lord. How far off lies thy power? Not near nor farther off my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. <laughs> One day, I fear me, noble lord, too late, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. A call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. Today, Today, unhappy day too late, or throws thy joys, friends, fortunes, and thy state. For all the Welshmen hearing that were dead are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Oh. <laughs> Comfort, <laughs> my liege, remember who you are. I had forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou coward! Majesty, thou sleeps! Is not the king's name twenty thousand <laughs> names? Arm, arm my name, a puny subject strikes at thy great glory. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. Ah, but who comes here? More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care tuned tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why, t'was my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be as great as we, greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too, and be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects, that 
We cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin, and decay. The worst is death, and death shall have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. Like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores as if the world were all dissolved to tears. So high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land in hard, bright steel and hearts harder than steel. Both young and old rebel, and all goes worse than I have power to tell. Too well! Too well thou tellst a tale so ill! Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What has become of Bushy? Where is Green, that they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I'll warrant they have made peace with Bolingbroke. Peace have they made with him indeed, my Oh, Lord. villains! Vipers! Damned without redemption! Dogs easily one to fawn on any man! Snakes! In my heart blood warmed at sting, my heart, three Judases, each one thrice worse than Judas, would they make peace? Terrible hell, make war upon their spotted souls for this. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy Green and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye. All of them at Bristow lost their heads. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where. A comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, worms, and epitaphs. For God's sake, let's sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How... Some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state, grinning at his pomp, allowing him a little breath, a scene. Two monarch eyes be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh, which walls about our life, were brass impregnable. Humor thus comes at the last, and with a little pin, bores through his castle wall and farewell king. Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel want. Taste grief. Need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? My lord. Wise men never sit and wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail, to fear the foe. Since fear oppresseth strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe, and so your follies fight against yourself. Fear and be slain. What more can come to fight? And fight and die is death, destroying death, while fearing dying pays death servile breath. My father hath a power. We inquire of him and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidst me well, proud Bolingbroke, I come to change blows with thee for this our day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown. An easy task it is to win our own. Say, Scoop, where lies my uncle with his power? Well, speak, sweetly, man, though thy looks be sour. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke. And all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his part. Thou hast said enough. Beshew thee, 
cousin, which did lead me forth of that sweet way I was in to despair. What say you now? What comfort have you now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly. That bids me be of comfort anymore. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away a king. Woe's slave shall kingly woe obey. That power I have, discharge, and let them go to ear the land, which hath some hope to grow, for I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, He word. does me double wrong, wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers, let them hence away from Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. So that by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed, and Salisbury is gone to meet the king, who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. <laughs> <laughs> the news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. <laughs> Would be seem the Lord Northumberland to say king, Richard. <laughs> Alack, the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes only to be brief, left I his title out. The time hath been. Had you been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you. For taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens are over our heads. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. But who comes here? <laughs> Welcome, Harry. What, will not this castle yield? The castle royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why? It contains no king. Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon Lyman stone, and with him are the lord armorer, lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a clergyman of holy reverence who it cannot learn. Oh, be like it is the bishop of Carlisle. <laughs> Noble lord, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle, through brazen trumpets, send the breath of parley into his ruined ears, and thus deliver, Henry Bolingbroke, on both his knees, doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come, even at his feet, to lay my arms and power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood, rained from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water, when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, I'll be the yielding water. See, see, King Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing, discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and to stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. Yet looks he like a king. Behold his eye, as bright as is the eagle, lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack! Alack for woe that any harm should stain so fair a show. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter unless you do profane, steal, or usurp. Tell Bolingbroke, for yon me thinks he stands, that every stride he takes upon my land is dangerous treason. He is come to open the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he looked for live in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face. Change the complexion of her made pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pasture's grass with faithful English blood. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth 
humbly kiss thy hand. And by the honorable tomb, he swears, that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones. And by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunts, and by the honor and worth of himself, comprising all that can be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once, his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince and just, and as I'm a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing kind commend. We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not? To look so poorly and to speak so fair, should we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor, and so die? No, good my lord, let's fight with gentle words till time lends friends and friends their helpful swords. Oh, God. Oh, God. That ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of suit. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name, or that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swell'st thou proud heart, I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? In God's name. Let it go. Amro. Oh, thou weeps, no. my tender hearted cousin. We'll make foul weather with despised tears our size, and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes and make a pretty match with shedding tears? Would not this ill do well? Well, well, I see. I talk but idly, and you laugh at me. Most mighty prince, Lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, and Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down. Down I come, like glistering Phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades in the base court. Base court! Where kings grow base to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. In the base court, come down. Down court, down king, for night owls shriek, for mounting larks should sing. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart makes him speak fondly like a frantic man, yet he has come. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty, my gracious lord. Oh. <laughs> fair cousin, you do debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know, as high at least although your knee be low. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all 
so far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as your, my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They well deserve to have, you know, the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hands. Nay, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to, for do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. to drive away the heavy thought of care. Madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy. Of either, madam. Oh. <laughs> of neither. For if of joy, being altogether wanting, it doth remember me the more of sorrow. Or if of grief, being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. For what I have, I need not to repeat in what I want. It boots not to complain. Madam. I'll sing. <laughs> Tis well that thou hast cause, but thou shouldst please me better, wouldst thou weep? I could weep, madam. Would it do thee good? And I could sing. Would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear from thee? But stay. Here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees. My wretchedness unto a row of pins, they will talk of state. For everyone doth sow against a change. Woe is for run with woe. And why should we, in the compass of a pale, keep law and form and do proportion, showing as in a model our firm estate, when our sea wall and garden, our England, is full of weeds, her fairest flower choked up our fruit trees, all unpruned, hedges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. All thy peace. Uh, Either the suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter that seemed in eating him to hold him up are plucked out. Root and all by Bolingbrook. I mean, the Earl of Wiltshire. <coughs> Bushy. <coughs> Green. <coughs> well, are they dead? Ah. <laughs> they are, and Bolingbrook hath seized the wasteful king. Oh, what pity is it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden? Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What? <laughs> Think thou the cane will be deposed? Oh, depressed he is already. Deposed his doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell black tidings. Oh, I am to death through want of speaking. <gasps> Thou old Adam's likeness, set to dress this garden, how dares thy harsh rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Dearest thou, thou little better thing than our divine his downfall. Say where, when, and how camest thou by this ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch! Oh, pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe this news, yet what I say is true. King Richard 
He is in the mighty hold of Bolingbroke, their fortunes both are weighed. In your lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the balance of great Bolingbroke, besides himself are all the English peers. And with that odds he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London and you will find it so. I speak no more than everyone doth know. Nimble mischance. That art so light of foot doth not thy embassage belong to me, and am I last that knows it? Oh, thou thinks to serve me last, that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. Come, I will go to meet at London, London's king in woe. For what was I born to this, that my sad look should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke? Gardner, for telling me these news of woe, pray God, the plants thou grabs may never grow. Oh, poor queen, oh, so that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill were subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear. Here in this place I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue, e'en for Ruth, here shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of a weeping queen. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts the heir, and his high scepter yields to possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, the fourth of that name. In God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Mary, God forbid. Worst in this royal presence may I speak, but best beseeming me to speak the truth. Good God, that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard. Then true noblesse would learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but, but they be by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks stirred up by God thus boldly for my king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king, and if you crown him, let me prophesy. The blood of English shall manure the ground and future ages groan for this foul act. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Resist it, prevent it, let it not be so, lest child, child's children cry against you woe. Well, have you argued, sir? And for your pains of capital treason, we arrest you here. My lord of Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. My lords, shall it please you to grant the common suit? Fetch hither, Richard, that in common view he may surrender. So we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. You lords who here are under our arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hand. Alack! Why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reign? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee, give sorrow, leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet well I remember the favors of these men, were they not mine? Did they not sometimes cry, All hail to me? So Judas did to Christ. But he in twelve found faith in all but one. I in twelve thousand, none. God save the king! Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king, although I be not he. And yet, 
Amen. If heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that service of thine own good will which tired majesty did make thee offer. The resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Your cousin, seize the crown. Your cousin. On this side, my hand. On that side, thine. Now, is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water? That bucket, down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst thou mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. May my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares? Set up, do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give, I have, though given away, they tend the crown. Yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no. No. I. For I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no. For I resign to thee. Now, mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my balm. With mine own hands I give away my crown. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved. And now, with all pleased that hast all achieved, long mayst thou live in Richard's seat to sit. <laughs> Then soon lie Richard in an earthy pit. God save King Henry! Unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight that it may show me what a face I have, since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Go, some of you. Fetch a looking glass. My lord, read o'er these accusations and grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and profit of this land, that by confessing them the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Fiend, thou dost torment me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. Give me that glass. There and will I read. Hmm. Alack, no flattering glass like to my followers in prosperity. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport, how soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. Shadow of my sorrow. <laughs> well, let's see. It is very true. My grief lies all within, and these external manners of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief which swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance, and I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty, which not only gives me cause to wail, but teachest me the way how to lament the cause. I'll ask one boon, and then be gone, and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither thou wilt, so I were from your sight. Go, some of you. Convey him to the tower. Ah, good. Convey, conveyors, are you all that rise thus nimbly from a true king's fall?
On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. A woeful pageant have we here beheld. The woes to come. Children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergymen, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? My lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take this sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow, your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper. I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. Join not with grief, fair woman, do not so to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream, from which awake the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn, brother sweet, to grim necessity, and he and I shall keep a league till death. Go, cloister thee in some religious house in France. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here have thrown down. What is my Richard, both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbrook deposed to thine intellect, hath he been in thy heart? The lion, dying, thrusteth forth his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else, enraged to be o'erpowered, and wilt thou take the correction? mildly kiss the rod and fawn on rage with base humility, which, which art a lion and the king of beasts. Oh, king of beasts indeed. If aught but beasts I had been still a happy king of men. Good, sometime queen, prepare thee hence for France. Think I am dead, and that even here thou takest us from my deathbed thy last living leave. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke has changed. You must to pump, written not into the tower. And madam, their orders taken for you with all swift speed. You must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder, wherewithal the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The time shall not be many hours of age, more than it is. Their foul sin, gathering edge, shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little. Helping him to all, he shall think that thou which knows the way to plant unrightful kings, will know again. The love of wicked men converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head, and there an end. Take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Public divorce. Bad men, you violate a twofold marriage, twixt my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Come, let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me. And yet, not so, for with a kiss t'was made. 
Uh. Pothouse Northumberland, I towards the north, where shivering cold and sickness pine the climb, my wife, to France, from whence set forth, in pomp she came, adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like hollowness on shorts of day. But must we be divided, must we part? I, hand from hand, my love, and heart from heart. Banish us both, and send the king with me. That were some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two together weeping make one woe. Go! Count thy way in sighs, I mine with groans. The longest way shall have the longest moan. Twice for one step I'll groan, the way being short and piece the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come, in wooing sorrow let's be brief, since wedding it there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part. Thus give I mine, and thus I take thy heart. Give me mine own again. T'were no good part to take on me to keep and kill thy heart. Now I have mine own again. Be gone, so that it may strive to kill it with a groan. Uh. Richard! <laughs> Make woe. Wanton with his fond delay, once more, adieu, the rest let sorrow say. <laughs> no! 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 My queen! No! No. My lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude, misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke. Great Bolingbroke mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring riders seemed to know, with slow but stately pace kept on his course, whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke! Whilst he, from one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countrymen! Alack, poor Richard! Where rode he the whilst? As in a theater, the eyes of men, after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, or with much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. No man cried, God save him! No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home, but dust was thrown upon his sacred head, with which such gentle sorrow he shook off, his face still combating with tears and smiles, the badges of his grief and patience, that had not God for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted, and barbarism itself hath pitied him. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, whose state and honor I for I allow. Here comes my son Amaral. <laughs> Armor all that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend. And, madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring? Madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. Who God knows, I had as lief be none as one. Well, bear you well on this new spring of time, lest you be cropped before you come to prime. 
What news from Oxford? Hold those jousts and triumphs? For aught I know, my lord, they do. You will be there, I know. Well, if God prevent not, I purpose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale, let me see the writing. My lord, tis nothing. No matter then who see it, I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It's a matter of small consequence, which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reasons, sir, I mean to see. I fear, I fear. What should you fear? Tis nothing but some bond that he has entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Bound to himself. What doth he with a bond that he is bound to wife? Thou art a fool. Boy, let me see the writing. I do beseech you, pardon me. I may not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. (sighs) Treason. Foul treason. Villain. Traitor. Slave. What is the matter, my lord? Ah, Who is within there? Saddle my horse. God, for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why? What is it, my lord? Saddle my horse, I say. Now, by mine honor, my life, my troth, I will appeach the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. What is the matter, Amaro? Good mother, be content. It is no more than my poor life must answer. Thy life answer? Uh, Poor boy, thou art amazed. I will unto the king. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is not my teeming day drunk up with time? And wouldst thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them have here taken the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here, then what is that to him? Away, fond woman, were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou groaned for him as I have done, thou wouldst be more pitiful. Oh, but now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I had been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard and not thy son. Ah! Sweet York, Sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman! After, Amaral, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be far behind. Though I be old, I doubt not but to ride as fast as York. And never will I rise up from the ground till Bolingbroke hath pardoned thee. Away, be gone! (laughs) <laughs> Where's the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? <laughs> God save your grace. I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourselves and leave us here alone. What is the matter with our cousin now? <laughs> Forever may my knees grow to the earth, my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon... Ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault. If in the first, how heinous ere it be, to win thy after love, I pardon thee. My liege, beware. Look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy bosom there. Oh, villain, I'll make thee safe. Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause for fear. What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Remember, as thou readest thy promise past, I do repent me. No, read not my name there. My heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, ere thy hand had set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. O oh, heinous, strong, and bold conspiracy! O oh, loyal father of a treacherous son, thou sheer, immaculate, and silver fountain, from whence this stream, through muddy passages, hath held his current and defiled himself. Thy overflow of good converts to bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son. So shall my virtue be his vices bought, and he shall spend mine honor with his shame as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold. Mine honor lives when his dishonor dies, or my shamed life in his dishonor lies. But, oh, my leash, speak with me, pity me. A beggar begs that never begged before. 
If thou do pardon whosoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. This festered joint cut off, the rest rest sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. O oh, king, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good arm. Not yet, I thee beseech. For ever will I walk upon my knees, and never see day that the happy sees, till thou give joy. Until thou bidst me joy by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joints mended be. <laughs> Ill mayst thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest, look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears, his prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. Our knees still kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy that true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first, and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon should be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king, let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth so meet. Good aunt, stand up! I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him, as God shall pardon me. Oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee. Yet I am sick for fear. Speak it again. <laughs> Twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. With all my heart, I pardon him. A god on earth thou art. But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight. Shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford, or where'er these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them, if once I know where. Uncle, farewell. Cousin, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed, and prove thee true. Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world in humor like the people of this world, for no thought is contented, the better sort. As thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word, thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune slaves, nor shall they be the last. Like seely beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there, and in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their misfortunes on the backs of such as have endured the like. <sighs> Thus play I in one person many people, and none of them contented. Sometimes am I king, then treason makes me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king, then am I kinged again. And by and by think I am unkinged by Bolingbrook, and straight am nothing. But. Whate'er I be, nor I, nor any man that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. <laughs> Music do I hear? <laughs> Keep time! <laughs> oh, how sour, 
sweet music is when time is broken, no proportion kept. This music mads me. Let it sound no more yet. Blessings on his heart that gives it me. But tis a sign of love. And love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. My lord, I <sighs> please you to fall to. Taste of it first as thou art wont to do. My lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the contrary. The devil take, Henry of Lancaster, and thee. Patience is stale, and I am weary of it. <coughs> Help! Help! How now? What means death in this rude assault? <coughs> Quenching fire that staggers, that's my person. Exton! <laughs> Thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own land. Mount, mount my soul. Thy seat is up on high. Whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. As full of valor as of royal blood, both have I spilled. Oh, would the deed were good. For now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest. Give them burial here. Grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle living to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it, joy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee have I seen. Great king, within this bier I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton, I thank thee not. For thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer. Love him murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor, but neither my good word nor princely favor with Cain, go wander through shades of night, and never show thy head by day nor light. Lords, I protest my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come mourn with me, for what I do lament, and put on sullen 
Black! Incontinent! I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood from off my guilty hand. March sadly after. Grace my mornings here in weeping after this untimely beer.